going to make you all move down to the front. So think long and hard before you yell out louder, so I'll make you move. Um, to my left is the town clerk, Sean Dooley. To his left is the assistant town clerk, Carol Green. Over at the bar table, we have the board of selectmen, Scott Bugby. Next to him is Jim Lehan. Next, leaving. Next to him, next to him is the chair of the board of selectmen, Robert Garrity. Next to him is the town administrator, Jack Hathaway. Beyond him is town council, Kay Doyle. And next to her is another town council from the same firm who was introduced to me and whose name I have completely forgotten. Jeff Blake. Good evening. Down in front of me, as you all know, are the board of the advisory board, and I am going to ask the chair, Pat Sneed, to introduce them. I've been asked to introduce through the microphone this time, so I will do so. At the far end is Dave Fenton, next to him Arlie Sterling, and Lisa Keating, our new member this year, Lisa Curl, Al Butters, uh, one of our two administrative assistants, Susan Jacobson, the other one just walked by me, Mary Harrington, and I passed to be the uh, chair. Great, thank you. Prior to my usual announcements, I would, uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Halfway, I don't know if you have any presentation for this, but we have some very exciting news. Um, Mr. Chief Chuck Stone, he was here, I was heckling him about a minute ago. Oh, there he is, there he is, I found you, I found you. Um, as many of you probably know, has been on the Norfolk Police Force for 40 years of service. 20 of them in the role of chief, and so we'd like to uh, uh, recognize him and take it away, Mr. Hathaway. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, reading Facebook today, <laughs> my source of all information, uh, Charlie Baker informed me that 150 years ago, this is the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and so I think that's about when you started. <laughs> in 1973, and uh, a certain assistant town treasurer collector in town likes to say that was when she was born. We won't point in out. Yeah. Uh, seriously, Chuck has been working for the town of Norfolk since 1973. I think uh, originally in the water department, spent a little time dabbling in the fire department, and then joined the police force. Uh, in 1976, um, and then in 1993, you were appointed, uh, coming up in December, you appointed uh, maybe 20 years as police chief. Uh, Chuck, many of you know, I think probably everybody that's a uh, regular town meeting member knows Chuck, and uh, he is one of the uh, most stand-up gentlemen that I know. Uh, he's a good friend, uh, an, an excellent manager, and uh, he's just somebody that's a pleasure to work with, so I appreciate that. So we've, we've had this plaque created for you. Uh, it's got the town of Norfolk seal on it, presented to Charles H. Stone, Jr., with gratitude from the town of Norfolk for 40 years of public service, including 20 years as chief of police, 1973 to 2013. So thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you, very good. All right, briefly before we get rolling, some of the rules, and as you all know, I typically will forget a few and then type in periodically throughout the meeting to uh, add another rule. The rules that I can remember at this time, uh, for each motion, um, which for in this instance, opportunities to go to the microphone. If your first time at the microphone, you may speak for five minutes. If your second time at the microphone, you may speak for three minutes. If there is a motion within the motion, for an example, somebody moves to amend or moves to indefinitely postpone, then that new motion entitles everybody to five minutes at the microphone the first time and three minutes at the microphone the 
second time. You are more than welcome to ask questions. However, I would advise you to bundle your questions, perhaps write them out and read them, because if you come up to the microphone, ask one question, and then leave, and come up and ask another question, those are your two times with the microphone. Often what we will have to, uh, the folks that you're asking questions of do is wait until there's been a number of questions asked, because some of the questions may be similar, and to avoid a back and forth kind of a conversation, which is, as you know, verbose and in town meeting, we will sometimes wait before the answer to the question is given. With respect to any motions that you want to make um, relative to the articles, again, as I said, if you have a motion to amend, motions to amend must be in writing, and that's for the purposes of the town clerk keeping track. Down in front of me on the floor is a red file folder with blank motions to amend in it. Uh, anytime you feel the need, I am by no means urging you to feel that need. You can restrain yourself, but if you do feel the need, those uh, forms are available for you right there. In addition, I want you to remember to always be cordial, that all of your statements should be directed to me and not to someone with whom you perhaps disagree. Uh, we're not going to turn it into a shouting match, it's not going to be a point-counterpoint, and it's not going to be Jerry Springer. We do not have the three, we're going, to, we're going crazy today. We don't have the three microphones that we usually have. Uh, Jay Talent is not here yet, but he'll be thrilled to know that we don't have the thumbs up, thumbs down, and question mark tonight. Just doing things a little bit differently. We have two microphones tonight. Um, they are, before we labeled them yes and no, but again, given the lack of uh, attendance that we anticipated, and while there's more people here than I had thought, there's certainly not uh, so many that we can't just go to whatever darn microphone we feel like, right? So we're going crazy. It's crazy town meeting night. You can go to whatever mic you want to ask your questions or make your comments. When you approach the microphone, it will go, if there's a line at both microphones, I'll re I will point to whomever is going to speak next. I do ask that you identify yourself by your first and your last name and then by your street address, and then address me with whatever points that you want to make. If there are questions, then people will answer those questions. All right, like I said, I'm sure I forgot something, but without further ado. Article one. Madam moderator, I move to transfer funds among town accounts as follows. From the following accounts. Free cash, $189,006. Conservation Commission expenses, $3,150. Public Safety Design Capital, $11,737. DPW Grounds Lawn Care, $23,650,000 for a total of $227,543. Two, Conservation Commission Salaries, $3,150. Public Safety Septic and Barking Capital, $11,737. Fire Department salaries, $36,000. Fire Department expenses, $10,244. Veterans Agent expenses, $15,000. Norfolk Public Schools, $100,000. DPW Grounds Maintenance salaries, $51,412 for a total of $227,543. Second. So, from the list, Basically, we have two transfers that are just moving amounts between uh, its department accounts, really no impact on funding. And then four other items, three of them comprise the bulk of it, one being Norfolk Public Schools for $100,000. Uh, this relates to enrollment was quite a bit higher than originally anticipated, and uh, the schools have needed to hire another teacher to handle that. Uh, we also have Fire department salaries and expenses, this relates to the callback program that we discussed at the town meeting in the spring. Um, after working through more of how the program would work, it was decided that it needed a higher funding level. And then lastly, in the DPW, uh, we're moving more to an in-source program for our lawn care, given the additional uh, areas that we have to cover now with dumps coming on in the spring and the uh, revamped Freeman Kennedy School. And so um, the DPW uh, has felt that it will be more beneficial to the town if we do this ourselves 
Um, some of the money was already spent for the fall, and that's why there's a funding discrepancy. I think the DPW feels when we come to next year's budget cycle, it should be closer to a one-to-one -one wash in terms of uh, spending. solutions an invoice dated November 5th 2011 this bill was not received until November of 2013 in a rare break with our usual unpaid bills IP we actually have one that came in so it's $803.52 and it'll get funded out of the current year's budget any questions or comments Seeing someone at the microphone, please identify yourself, Mr. Rosenberg. <laughs> <laughs> David Rosenberg, uh, 123 North Street. Um, the question is, uh, what is this bill for? That's what, what's covered by the, this payment? Uh, Vision does a number of different services for us. I believe uh, John. John, our chief assessor, can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, uh, they did some services for us to uh, go around and evaluate uh, personal property for home businesses and office uh, businesses, so it's a kind of a personal services contract uh, that Vision does for many towns. Any further questions or comments relative to this article? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item. Article 2, as written in the warrant, position we did not uh, we actually ended up putting it on the warrant so that is in, in essence a support action let me tell you why we're, why I would like us to vote no on the IP motion last year as you know for the first time in many years we put some money into our stabilization fund um, bringing up bringing it up to about 1.1 million dollars this was the first time we put significant funding in in stabilization since well since a long time ago, probably 1995, 1996. That fund stands at 1.1 million, which is about 3% of our budget. Um, looking at the way towns across the Commonwealth use stabilization, we're in about the bottom third percentage-wise of budget and stabilization. Now, stabilization is your savings account. It's a place where we can put funding in, it takes a two-thirds vote, but it also takes a two-thirds vote to get it out. That's not insurmountable. And in fact, last year, we took 97000 out of stabilization to help King Philip. That's one of the reasons I'd like to put some money back. When we took the 97000 out last spring, I said that 
I would be in front of you as soon as possible to put that money back in. So this is a down payment on that. Why 50000 Why not 100000 Well, 50000 is 10% of our free cash. Now, free cash, for those of you who don't know, is funding that came in that either is because we didn't spend everything we budgeted in the previous fiscal year, or there were additional revenues we didn't expect. In the case uh, in here, there's a lot of funding we didn't do. I mean, a lot of spending we didn't do that we funded, but also there's $122,000 from NSTAR that we hadn't budgeted in as a revenue. It's from the solar field. It is available to use in this way. If we put it away now, this money goes in our savings account, and frankly, it removes the temptation to spend it later, and we'll spend it if we really need it. It leaves us plenty of money to spend in the next fiscal year. It leaves us plenty of money to spend on capital. Um, if we have a capital discussion, which I think we will shortly, you'll see that there's a significant amount of revenue available or soon to be available for capital needs. This is an effort to put a little more money away into stabilization, something we should be doing every day, every year. We should set a goal, 5% again is a goal many communities strive to, and have that money available if we really do need it. We don't need this 50K in the short term. Let's do this, let's do it every year. So thank you. I ask you to vote no on the indefinite postponement. Um, David Rosenberg, I still live on North Street. Um, I, I guess I'd, <laughs> I hope so. Um, I guess I'd like to understand a little more clearly um, what the access to the money is if it is not put in the stabilization fund and what the access is if it is put in the stabilization fund, whether it is earning interest at the same rate in either place that it could be, um, and um, um, if someone can a little uh, clearer uh, statement of the pros and cons of moving it versus leaving it where it is. And, and I guess a clarification of where it is exactly. Madam Moderator, I'll answer. I love it. From a, from a appropriation point of view or an availability point of view, as Mr. Garrity said, uh, moving this money into the stabilization makes it a little bit more challenging to spend because it, it would, it, in the, from the stabilization fund, it would require a two-thirds vote. Whereas if it was just, uh, if it stayed in the free cash account, it would require a majority vote. So if we're going to use this in the spring for some reason, those, that would be the two differences. As far as earning potential, it's, uh, the stabilization money does get uh, segregated into a separate bank account. With today's interest rates, the, the differentials are, I can't, I, you know, honestly couldn't tell you which is, what we had, it's, it's minuscule differences. Uh, so that's, that's the difference. Now, Mr. Lehan. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Jim Lehan, Fredrickson Road. Uh, Mr. Garrity and I agree in principle about putting money away. Uh, probably most of you know I'm a very fiscally conservative person, and I believe that we should put money away in the stabilization fund. Where we disagree is when. At this current point during the fiscal year, we're one third of the way through the year. We have no idea what snow and ice will be. Our major resources, our major fund revenues, such as excise tax, haven't come in yet. They come in in January and February. I believe this money should be put away in the spring meeting, not in the fall town meeting. To put money away, lock it up under a two thirds vote prior to knowing what your earnings will be. You cannot deficit spend in government. And we have been very conservative in our budgets, we've been very conservative, and I agree that we will probably have more free cash. We now currently have $1,023,000 worth of free cash. It's the highest number in our stabilization, excuse me, stabilization fund. It's the highest number this town's ever had. Uh, and we do agree that we should put more away over time. But to put it away, to lock money up prior to knowing what your revenues will be, to me, is just not a fiscally wise decision. We need to go through the process, see what our revenues are, see what our income are. We always have unanticipated expenses, always. You're seeing some of them tonight in the schools. They just cannot be foreseen. And we need to hold and reserve some of, those, some of that cash to be able to meet those obligations should they occur. If things go as we hope, and they have traditionally in the past, we'll come before you in May, make a recommendation, hopefully put money away from the stabilization fund and continue to build up our reserves. The town is very financially stable. We're one of only three or four towns in the entire state of Massachusetts during the last five or six years that had their bond rating raised, not decreased. 
So we're doing the right things financially, and I'd like us to continue that process, not lock up the funds prematurely, see what our expenses are, make that decision in May. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against the motion, which is at this point just to indefinitely move home? That's me, Frank Lee Fredrickson Road. Um, I am in favor of indefinitely postponing this. Mr. Lehan has uh, given some of the points that I uh, was going to mention. This should be part of the budget process, I believe. Uh, secondly, when we look at our optimistic uh, free cash numbers, uh, the amount that is, uh, a large chunk of that is money to be received, prison mitigation funds, et cetera. Um, while it seems that those are going to happen, uh, it has happened in the past that money has appeared and disappeared depending on the whims of the legislature. So uh, those are not quite birds in hand yet. So I believe we should give ourselves more flexibility, not lock up as much in uh, the stabilization fund at this point and see what the situation is in the spring. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, like this? Yeah, this is my second
indefinitely postpone Article 5. Second. Making decisions about the town's capital spending and how the funds are to be raised to support that capital spending are a vital part of the town meeting process. The town has set up a, a lengthy process of review to ensure that the many millions of dollars of capital requirements that we face because of deferred capital spending for many years are addressed in the proper priority and the funding is, is found in the minimum cost fashion. The half a million dollars of capital requests that have been identified uh, uh, partially here, and I suspect there are uh, similar pages following this, um, are no doubt have substantial merit. Uh, the funding plan which would borrow and obligate the town to pay $127,000 uh, of debt over time is also no doubt well considered. However, the advisory board had four minutes uh, to review this this evening. We feel that uh, that kind of review is inadequate to the amount of money involved. We would not do our duty to the town to present a recommendation without more review of this, uh, this amount of money or this funding plan, uh, and thus our proposal that the motion be inducted to post office. Questions or comments relative to Mr. Rosenberg? I think you'll be standing. <laughs> comfort, you comfy, you can wait. David Rosenberg, um, I, I um, listened to what Mr. Sterling just said, and I'm a little perplexed about uh, how this mechanism evolved that there were only four minutes to consider this. I, I appreciate an explanation of how this proposal moved forward and how the time was for consideration was so short. Do we have anyone who can answer that question? Would you like to answer that question, which doesn't count towards your two times? It's an efficiency issue, I don't know. Um, I'd like to offer an amendment, if I may please, Madam Moderator. I'd like to amend the advisory board's recommendation. I have it in writing for you. You're moving, there's currently a, a, a motion to indefinitely postpone. And I would, like to, I would like to move to amend that motion. So how, you're gonna to move to amend the motion to indefinitely postpone? Correct. To postpone for less than an indefinite uh, amount of time? I may be phrasing it incorrectly, but I, I would like to move to appropriate like to move forward with a capital recommendation. So you are opposing the motion to indefinitely postpone? Yes. So right now, the motion that's before the, the body is whether or not to indefinitely postpone. There is a question that Mr. Rosenberg okay. has asked. I'll ask as, Mr. Rosenberg's question. As, that needs to get answered. After uh, which we will debate whether or not to indefinitely postpone. In this juncture, you can get up and say why we need to indefinitely postpone. Hopefully they'll vote it down and we'll proceed on, but that's, that's, that's how it goes. Okay. Uh, your question, we, we have a backlog of capital, uh, probably seven years worth of backlog of capital uh, that we postponed, Mr. Sterling is correct. Uh, some of the issues, though, are, I would not quite frame as capital, in some respects they are, but they're more of a crisis nature because they're more operational. For example, the HLD school has a significant issue. Uh, we have broken and failing police cruisers that we need to get taken care of. Uh, we have a number of issues that just can't wait. Uh, and they're quite frankly costing us money. And to delay that transaction is inappropriate as far as we do. They're correct. We've been struggling with this for quite a bit of time. There's a reason for it. Last year, we were supposed to get some mitigation money. The state, it's independent wisdom, pulled it out of the budget and didn't give it to us. And then, to all of our amazement, they ended up sending us last year's prison medication money, $225,000. It's in the bank. We have it. Unfortunately, and we plan to use that for capital, and it was related to a number of the capital projects that we wanted to uh, bring to you this evening. Unfortunately, we learned, because it was 2013 revenue, we could not appropriate it until it was part of the free cash that won't be certified until June. English version of that is that we can't spend it. We have it. It's in the bank. We can't spend it. So we have that money that will be available to us when the free cash is certified in June. We need to spend it. 
So we've worked out a process by which we feel it is financially correct, financially prudent to make the investments we need to make at this particular point in time. We know we have the funds set aside, $225,000 that will flow into free cash for the following fiscal year. And that's the recommendation we'd like to bring forward. So I ask you to give us that opportunity and to vote down the indefinite postponement and give us an opportunity to present to you the capital request. So before Mr. Rosenberg uh, engages in this second time at the microphone, I think I now understand the issue. We do have to vote up or down the motion to indefinitely postpone. If it's voted down, I understand you then may have an amendment. Is that correct? A substitute motion? So, okay, so once, once we get through this whole IT thing, which we're getting a little used to now, then we'll move on from there. Mr. Rosenberg, second time at the microphone. And I'm still Mr. Rosenberg. Um, <laughs> I, I understand um, that the advisory committee and the board of selectmen are basically volunteers, that these jobs take a lot of time, and uh, that the people who are doing them are very generous in providing their, their time to the town. Um, I don't have any question about um, the need for the expenditures that Mr. Weehan outlined, but I do not understand why this issue was raised, this crisis arose just a few minutes before the town meeting. I, I would have anticipated that the knowledge about the funds that we received from prison mitigation but are unable to spend must have been known at least a few weeks ago, possibly earlier. And I would, I, I, I know that people have put in a lot of personal time and, and I appreciate all their effort, but I really would like to understand the mechanism and, and why this was not um, brought forward and considered in a more timely way. Mr. Hathaway, Certainly. thank you Mr. Rosenberg. I certainly appreciate the advisory board and Mr. Rosenberg's comments. Uh, this is certainly not the ideal process that we'd like to go through. Uh, but I would just point out a couple of things. One is that we we went through the advisory, we went through the capital committee process. My town meeting is kind of blurred together. I think it was last spring when when, the, when we actually lost that prison mitigation money. So these things, these items have already been through that scrubbing process of the capital committee other than the one vehicle for the uh, alien control officer. Um, and then the heater, uh, the boiler for the uh, hot water heater for the HL Day School. HL Day School uh, item is the, the HL Day, uh, the HL Day uh, heater was actually the item that uh, kind of inspired us to have the capital process. And it was something that we did talk about with the advisory board. Uh, at their last meeting, so that you know, that was a little, you know, that that item we did talk about, and the and the school committee raised that as an issue uh, some time ago. So, uh, there's a, I guess to just to, to end the point, the, these items, I feel, have been through the capital process. So, when we had an abbreviated kind of town meeting schedule here. Uh, we went through the board selection process. Yes, the town the advisory board had a limited number of meetings, and then we were going to meet with them tonight. And, and as is typical with town meeting night, there's a lot of things to quickly cover, and this is one item that we didn't get to. So they offered to postpone it, and they said, why don't we have the selectmen and the town administrator make a point for the capital items, and we can vote on them at that level. So that's what I would recommend that we do, is we have, they weren't comfortable making the recommendation, I think the selectmen are very comfortable with the argument. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Colleen Spigny for Bristol Pond Drive. I, I guess I'm trying to understand the impact of the water here and the fire panel and how imminent a concern is this. Is a postponement going to cause safety issues? Mr. Hathaway? Chief, or? Chief. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Bushnell, Free Medway Street, also your fire chief. Uh, just to try to put some of the timeline, the chronology is together. Uh, during the first week of school, after the schools were inspected by the building commissioner, Bob Bullock, and myself, 
One of the problems that we encountered was the hot water heater, which supplies all the hot water to uh, each of these school. Uh, the heater has been uh, talked about for a number of years, the last three inspections, as far as being a problem. And during the last inspection, it was found to be in, a, in an unsafe condition. And at that time, we locked it up, had it up the heater itself, and spoke to uh, the school board as well as to what the situation was. And we moved forward with some uh, internal repairs, but obviously the, the unit had reached the end of its life expectancy. We spoke to the manufacturer and confirmed that as well on behalf of uh, the school committee. Uh, the perfect storm followed that during the first week of school, we learned that the school's fire alarm panel failed during the course of the day. Uh, we sent the fire department just looking out duty, shipped over, spent some time there to the end of school, and continued the school day going. Uh, we made arrangements to have a repair company come in. The problem we have is the uh, fire alarm panel itself uh, no longer has parts readily available. We were fortunate enough to find parts uh, from actually the West Coast, and they were overnight in with the panel back in, uh, back in service. And what we did, we were able to accomplish that without any, any interruption from the, the school calendar. Uh, so those certainly, uh, in, in my mind, as your public safety official from the fire side, represent exigent circumstances, and we'd certainly like to see those uh, corrected. I'm sure that Dr. Lee would feel the same way. So I just wanted to make a point of clarification. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I think I should be absolutely clear. The advisory board uh, is in no way recommending that there be any delay in replacing a water heater that fails or any equipment that causes a problem. There are funds available that can be used to manage emergency situations if they are in fact emergencies. And uh, we would not under any circumstances suggest something that would uh, uh, close the schools or something like that. Uh, uh, this is a the vote that we recommend not to take, or sorry, the, the indefinite postponement that we're discussing this evening has to do with a specific funding source, a specific mechanism for spending money. Nothing to do with the timing of the replacement of the boiler. That should proceed imminently or very quickly uh, as needed. And the funds will be found to take care of that. Mr. Pat Smith, 19 Credits in Rome. Um, I just would like to uh, reinforce the comment Arlie just made. Um, this vote did not reflect uh, an, a vote on the merits of the proposals. It was simply a reflection of the fact that we did not have time to give it due consideration, uh, and therefore we were not in a position to offer an opinion, uh, not so much as to the merits of the acquisitions, but as to the specific method of being funded. The discussion about whether it should be through bonding or through <coughs> purchase by cash, that sort of thing. So uh, we are in no way. Uh, speaking about the uh, merits of the you know, specific items being proposed, but simply that the process did not allow us time to uh, make a uh, more considered recommendation. Well. John Wells in Trailside Way. Just a question. Does the postponement of the 80000 for the molars uh, disturb the plan for the EPW to start mowing in-house rather than subbing it out? Uh, by the time Tom Lee appropriates the things were bought, I'm talking probably July before the equipment can be purchased, which means that that would postpone the whole change of the structure of cutting all the lawns, perhaps a half a year to a year. I have a comment from the EPW. Uh, I Good evening. Uh, Bob McGee, EPW Director. The, uh, the $80,000 uh, uh, represents the difference between having to sub out lawn care throughout the town that would include some new improvements over the last couple of years, and that would be, the, uh, that would be uh, we have a three miles of new Route 115 that we manicure. We have a new Freeman Kennedy School that we cut, and until it was complete entirely, we didn't know what specifications to write for a, for a contract. So together with the town administrator, we decided that in-house we could do a better job than if we would contract this out. Without the $80,000, I'm afraid, that would probably cost us anywhere from uh, $1,400 to $2,800 a week um, until this, uh, until the fall town meeting, where the spring town meeting, excuse me, where it could be approved.
to answer or comment on the water heater and the fire panel. Um, as Chief Michelle mentioned, everything currently at the HRD is operational. Um, we did have repairs made. We, um, in the spring last year when we presented our budget, we originally had a $40,000 line for storage and maintenance uh, because we were anticipating the cost of this um, hot water heater having to be repaired as well as repairs to the fire suppression system. Um, and because PP is in a budget situation, we were asked to um, take that money out of our request, budget request and come back to the town in the fall um, as capital items. So that does reflect um, you know, that, that $40,000 that we had originally incorporated in the budget. Um, and as far as delays, um, we do realize that it's a crisis situation and there might be other revenue sources that we can fund that for. However, um, the hot water, it wouldn't be something we could do instantaneously. If the hot water heater were to fail and for us to access that money and order parts, we would have to close school for a period of time. And we're trying to do this preventatively so we can do it over a scheduled vacation um, and not interrupt services. Thank you, Madam Honor. Jim Lee and Rick Sora. All of the items that you see up there are items that we view as reasonably critical for one or two reasons. Either the timing, which is a consideration for mowing, uh, also a consideration for cruisers and things that we're going to talk about later uh, as part of this article as well. Uh, to delay these purchases will, over time, cost us more money than delaying until the springtime meeting. Uh, in terms of the revenue sources, just let me share with you some of the revenue sources at the town has or will be having. Um, $225,000 of prison mitigation money is currently in the bank, but we cannot appropriate it until June once it's certified as free cash. We have $72,000 worth of reimbursement, which falls into the same consideration. We can't spend it until it's certified as free cash, so it's not available to us, even though it's in the bank. And we anticipate having another $225,000 over the next few weeks from the prison mitigation money, which is still, at least as of today, still in the budget. Which is, if you add that to the free cash after we spent $189,000, leaves us over $800,000. What we're trying to do is to manage the differential between debt and free cash so that we have sufficient reserves where we have unanticipated costs. The advisory board, Mr. Joey is right, the advisory board has sufficient funds to meet the need on the heater. They have a $50,000 emergency fund. However, if we spend that, their emergency funds come up. And we don't have any resources without coming back to a town meeting in order to allocate money. We can't spend what you don't allow us to spend. So by deferring these recommendations and if the advisory board spends its reserve funds, we're out. We're done. And we've had situations in the past where we've had to call an emergency town meeting to rectify that. So what we're trying to do is to prevent those types of occurrences. We're trying to manage through the cycle of the way the funds hit our books and the way we're allowed to spend them. And that's what the recommendation is that we want to bring forward to you today. Thank you, Mr. Lehan. <clears throat> is there anyone else who would like to be heard on the issue that is solely before the meeting right now, which is whether or not to indefinitely postpone Article 5. Seeing no one, all of those in favor of indefinite postponement, please say aye. All of those opposed? No. Uh, majority was required. The indefinite postponement was uh, shot down. I was trying to come up with a more elegant way of putting it. I failed. Um, so now we have Article 5, which I think someone from the advisory board Someone going to read? No, you can do it. Madam Moderator, I'd like to offer a substitute motion. Thank you. Hello. Friend to the back. I move to appropriate the sum of $125,000 for the purpose of paying costs of acquiring police tasers. No Fork Elementary School water heater and fire panel, and four mowers for the Department of Public Works. And further, I move to appropriate the sum of $126,890 for the purpose of paying costs of acquiring an animal control pickup truck and two police vehicles for the police department, including the payment of all costs incidental and related thereto. And that to meet this appropriation, the town treasurer, with the approval of the selectmen, is hereby authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 7, Paragraph 9 of the General Laws, or any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore. Do you happen to have an overhead of that? I don't know the words, but the items are... Okay. Up. So now, I'm looking at Tay Doyle. 
now we vote whether or not to argue the substitute motion or do we just argue the substitute motion? Once it's seconded. Yeah, second. So it's not an amendment. They can just roll forward. Exactly, Madam okay. Moderator. This is now the main motion on the floor. Awesome. That moves things along quite, quite nicely. All right, so it's the main motion on the floor. Does everyone get it or someone need them to reread it? All right. Does anyone have any questions or comments um, relative to the new substituted Article 5, the information of which is on the board? Seeing nobody. Have, oh. Wow, you're quick. Sorry, Madam Moderator. Pat Snead, 19 Fredrickson Road. Um, the uh, projections for free cash, uh, if these are bought, bought with cash, uh, will put the number fairly low. And I wonder if consideration could be given to uh, purchasing the capital equipment with uh, bond uh, instead of uh, cash. Um, the amount, these are longer term items. They do have a lifespan that's going to be three years plus, and it seems to me it would make, fun, uh, make sense to consider uh, paying for the borrowing and leaving our free cash a little more flexible. Can someone answer that? Mr. Lehan? Uh, Mr. Sneed, you're right. We looked at both sides of that, and actually we've got a split recommendation that part of this is free cash and part of this is borrowing. Uh, if we spend what we've recommended and then borrow for the vehicles, we will have $230,058 left in free cash with an additional two twenty five and additional two hundred twenty five thousand and additional seventy two thousand in the bank that will be certified in June. So we felt that left us a level of comfort. Um, but that's why we're borrowing for the three vehicles as they really have true capital components and we felt that was a wiser way to do it. Any other questions or comments relative to article number five as substituted? Seeing none, we'll move to item number six, the motion to approve the approval of the substituted motion article five as Madam Moderator, I move to approve Article 6 as printed in the warrant. Second. Approval of this article designated designate public land in Highland Park at Highland Lake as the Highland Grove Park to commemorate the New York and New England Excursion Park. <clears throat> Madam Moderator, I'm Barbara Bartholomew, Toilet Tangent Street, and I'm a member of the of what they stir up the commission. Uh, Highland Grove represents a, a significant site and period in Norfolk history. The town of Norfolk was created in 1870, and five years later, the New England, the New York New England Railroad uh, decided to uh, select the site for an excursion park, and they chose to locate it here in Norfolk. Uh, between Campbell Street and Seacock Street, utilizing what was then the mill pond. They, they proceeded in 1875 to buy up a considerable amount of land surrounding the lake. And on the map uh, on the screen, the yellow area is what they purchased. They largely, the largest purchase was, was from Tom Watson, a farmer. They bought a small piece down the bottom from Levi Mann one of our selectmen, the owner of the sawmill, and then they bought a small portion up at the top of the railroad track from the, from the uh, then mill, the Campbell Paper Mill. They proceeded to, to build a facility as the map depicts. Uh, that map is created from an insert on an 1895 map on Northport that was drawn by A.G. Gunning. And I modified it a little bit so as to, to illustrate what, we're, what, what we speak. As for the name Highland Lake, it was actually affixed to the body of water by the railroad. Prior to that, 
the, the, the pond or the, the milk pond had a variety of names depending on who was utilizing its water power. And if you go way back to the 1700s, it was the Morris family who were operating a sawmill and a gristmill at that site of the mill. Uh, after them came the Fayles family. They operated the local foundry and blast furnace there in the early 1800s. In the mid-1800s, the conversion was made to a paper mill operated by the, Cam by the Campbell brothers. The, the map shows the extent of the features. The trains came out from Boston. The trains came up from Putnam, Connecticut, and Valley Falls, Rhode Island. And they carried hundreds and thousands of passengers who came to spend a day in the hot park at this park. It was a, the railroad station is up on your left, and you see that uh, from the railroad station, passengers would be embarked, and they would cross over the neck of the lake uh, uh, right there, and that was a footbridge, a covered footbridge, which brought them into the park. To the left side uh, was a bowling alley, a check room, and then the paths could lead them down. They could proceed down to the dining hall. They could proceed to the dance hall, the skating rink. They could, could go over towards the lake. There was a carousel for the children. There was a boating dock and boats that they could rent to, to roll out onto the lake. There was a 16-lap track. And then there were footbridges over the Stock River as it came into the bottom of the mill pond. And there was a baseball diamond tucked in there. Uh, there was a, a quarter mile lap track. They ran bicycle races, foot races on the track. And then if they wanted to proceed to the north, there was a pavilion where they could sit and enjoy the breezes in the lake. And then they created a swimming hole further up in another dock. Swimming hole because the mill pond was not, was not suitable to swim in. And the number of persons who came uh, is phenomenal. I, I don't think anyone in North Park is appreciative of this, but at one point in 1883, one of the Boston papers recorded that 32,000 people came to visit Highland Grove in a single season. I found all kinds of reports in the old newspapers that show that the trains came in carrying, carrying usually 1,000 to 1,500 children at a time and that many civic and church groups in Boston would sponsor a day in the country for the underprivileged city, city children. The, the first year the, the park was in operation, it had a very distinguished guest. <coughs> President Hayes, on his way to Boston by train, stopped at Highland Road for breakfast. His train actually sat on the siding by Seacon Street while he enjoyed that breakfast on that April morning. There were many other dignitaries that came to conduct uh, revival meetings, religious uh, congregations came to it, and later towards the turn of the century, the labor unions, the flooding gang labor unions began to use it on weekends for their rallies. So we find that this is a very significant and, and historic point in Norfolk that many are unaware of. We, the Historic Commission, would like to commemorate that by taking a, the remaining portion of the CPC-funded purchase at Highland Lake and designating it to be the Highland Grove Park. Thank you. Thank you. I also found that description um, not only interesting, but in fact fascinating and, and appreciated. Um, I'd like to understand, though, um, more about what actually proposed to do with this land. Uh, um, I, I understand that the map that we saw was what the um, uh, excursion park looked like then, and I'd like to understand what part of that land is being acquired now, or is being proposed to be acquired. And this um, uh, motion says it's being acquired to, commem to commemorate the excursion park 
but I'm not quite sure how one uses land to commemorate something, and I'd like to understand exactly what use the land would be put to, what, what would be there, what access there would be to it, um, how it would be used if it were required. Uh, I don't like to put you off, but if you would wait until out of the line, I, I think we can explain it. Uh, we're speaking of the right, right hand side. Over to the left, where the park once was, over by Seacock Street, that is all private property now. That's where the King Phillips Trail comes in off of Seacock, and it's been developed on both sides. So we're on the we're on the on the southeast side of the Scott River as it comes in, and basically the upper part is what four years ago the town meeting approved to be the the Bales uh, Memorial Park, and there were 22 acres there. We subtracted 13 and a half of the Bales Park. So down the bottom where the baseball diamond and the quarter mile track are is the area we're asking to be designated as Highland Grove. And what we plan to do is we plan to put a, a, a small panel, a two by two panel, uh, similar to the one on Town Hill, that will depict this map. Uh, it will have a timetable of the, of the trains that came in and out on a specific day or a, a speech that was given by, given by Henry Beecher at the bar. And on the right side will be a brief history. So there are people coming there. Now, the area of this area is pretty much just natural, and it is intended to stay natural. Just walking trails for people to enjoy, and, and an open space, but uh, not, not an active or cultivated act recreational area. Thank you very much. It was my understanding that Article 6 was just about the naming. Yes, it is. There's no acquisition in it's just changing the name. Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank 
director at Sunnybrook Wildlife Sanctuary here in town. Um, if you um, could move to the next slide, if you can uh, see it. We're here essentially to ask the town to join Mass Audubon in partnership to protect a small strategic parcel of open space. This is the gray property on Marshall Street, uh, shown uh, outlined in red. Uh, to the north is our Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary, and across Marshall Street to the south is Lynn Farm. And we think there are a number of reasons why this parcel merits preservation. In and of itself, it's 4.3 acres of nice upland oak pine woods that adds to the uh, natural area that you see on the map and uh, provides all the environmental, uh, aesthetic, wildlife, uh, and recreational benefits of that large natural area. Um, in addition, it strengthens uh, what is currently just a 50 foot corridor uh, between the main part of the sanctuary, Marshall Street, and, uh, strengthens that to over 200 feet wide for both wildlife and recreational purposes, linking the sanctuary better to Marshall Street and to Lynn Farm. Uh, the next slide shows a, a close up of the property. That's the Bristol Pond, the state subdivision to the right. Um, you can see the, the property uh, heavily forested, a uh, great deal of pine, some oak, um, all up. The next slide uh, is uh, typical of that property. This is the frontage on Marshall Street. Next slide shows the numbers. Um, the value of the property has been appraised by an independent appraisal uh, at $225,000. Uh, the owners, uh, siblings Janet and Alan Gray, very generously offered to sell it for conservation for half that price, or $112,500. Um, we wish that Mass Audubon could afford that all by itself, but we can't. Um, we do not sit on a pot of money that we can just easily write checks on uh, to purchase land. In every case, we have to work with donors and partners to uh, pull the funds together to make uh, land acquisition possible. And in this case, uh, we see it as, as possible um, by pulling uh, funds uh, from three sources. One is from fundraising, and we will clearly need to do a fundraising campaign for this. A second is that we have applied to the state's uh, conservation partnership program for a substantial grant. Uh, we should hear about that grant in the next uh, two to three weeks. And then the third is to turn to the town and to ask you uh, to uh, essentially purchase a conservation restriction on the property as a way to contribute funds towards its preservation. Uh, you can see the numbers uh, in terms of getting to the 112500 sale price. Uh, Mass Audubon would contribute a little over $78,000, uh, and the town would contribute a little over $34,000. When you throw in all the associated costs, legal costs, other due diligence, uh, appraisal, environmental assessment, etc., and setting aside some funds for stewardship, uh, the numbers work out as shown on the bottom, um, with almost $97,000 coming from Mass Audubon. Oh, and I can't even spell Audubon, that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Don't, please don't tell anyone. <laughs> and then 46,000 from the town, which is what's in this article. And finally, the last slide uh, to review what the town gets for its purchase or its funds is a conservation restriction, which is a legal agreement that goes on record in the registry of deeds and permanently binds the property as conservation land, forever prohibiting development, regardless of what happens to Mass Audubon in 100 or 300 years. Um, and also guaranteeing that the property will always be open to the public, um, subject to uh, sanctuary rules and regulations or reasonable uh, regulations for, uh, for public use. In addition, Mass Audubon has made a commitment uh, to the town and to the CPC um, that uh, if the town wishes to construct uh, uh, up to four parking spaces on the property uh, at some point, um, that, that we will convey that right to the town as part of the deal. Thank you. Thank you. Now that the uh, experts have spoken, does anyone have any questions or comments relative to this article? Donna Jones, North Street, and uh, Matt uh, Stonebrook Wildlife Sanctuary uh, Committee member. I uh, wanted to let everybody know that NAWPA residents are always free, uh, are welcome to walk the trails for free. John Wilson, Trail Slide Way. Uh, just a couple of points of clarity. I'm also chairman of the Conservation Commission. A uh, question I have for Stony Brook was a similar question I proposed when it came before our committee, and 
why is it that we cannot own the land uh, rather than Stony Brook? So we're spending this money for a right. One of the statements talk about perpetuity, but an act of the state legislature can remove a conservation restriction, which is why I was always in favor of owning the land rather than not. And then technically, I, as the article is composed, it talks about $46,000 for the purposes of purchasing a restriction, conservation restriction on the land and constructing a parking lot. My understanding is this $46,000 has nothing to do with the construction of the parking lot, which with the grade changes, the retaining wall needed, and fencing, etc., may be in the facility of in excess of $10,000. So the first question I have is sort of like, why can't we own it rather than you? And secondly, I think there's a technical error with the article, and I would like to have somebody stand and correct me that this restriction can be removed by an act of the state legislature. Incidentally, as far as just so folks know, for the, the structural setup, Lynn Farm has a 76-foot access into the park. When you go 100 feet on the right, there's a spot for diagonal parking. The difference with the Lynn Farm is the grades are all uh, stable. No grading would have to be done. It's a matter of putting down gravel to put the access road in the parking. And that is great at Lynn Farm. And right now, we have a 300-foot walk from this restricted area down to the Lynn Farm. It seemed to be a better purpose to put parking at Lynn Farm. <laughs> Lynn Farm is like most of our trails in town. We promote them. We apply them to developers. They all go unattended. Most of them uh, are not noticeable as you pass by in the street, including Lynn Farm. Uh, none of them were attended to. There are no trail markers. There is no trail map on the trails on any of our farms. So basically, these are enjoyed by the director butters, and uh, people as the butters tend to take some of the land as their own. Uh, because of the proximity to their backyard. So uh, I present those questions and I uh, hope we'd like to answer them. I appreciate it. The Audubon fellow is standing right behind you, so I'm assuming you're going to answer. I'll answer the first two, uh, and then I might turn to Cindy for the third about the parking. Um, with regard to why doesn't the town just purchase it and own it itself? Uh, it could. Um, the purchase price is $112,500. We came to the town with this idea so that um, by dividing the cost up among some for the town, some for Mass Audubon to raise some donors, and some from the state through a pot of money that's only available to private nonprofit land trusts like Mass Audubon, it was a little more digestible. Um, with what we proposed, Mass Audubon winds up owning but also being responsible for the management of the property. So it's land that the town gets to use uh, and visit, um, but without the cost of uh, management uh, falling on the town. So we felt this made more sense, but um, it's, it's certainly something that, that can be discussed further. Um, second, regarding the conservation restriction, I'll, I'll defer to town council, but my understanding is that a conservation restriction held by a town, which this is, would be, can only be released by a sequence of events that includes um, the majority vote of the Conservation Commission, a uh, two-thirds vote of town meeting, and a two-thirds vote of each house of the state legislature. Does that sound right to you? So it, it, the, the state legislature on its own cannot um, eliminate a conservation restriction held by the town. Cindy, on the part. I will note that um, the final board article had a slight wording change to what I submitted. And I actually um, asked the town administrator last week about this. My original wording said the right to construct a parking area um, because no, this does not budget any amount for construction of parking. It was just had to do with getting a deed or whatever legal agreement the town would receive to construct the parking. Um, with regard to grades and such, um, we've looked at the front of the parcel. We're not proposing many parking spaces don't really think there'd be a retaining wall necessary. There would obviously be some grading changes. Uh, we were going to wait until Audubon's funding came through in order to more thoroughly think out and, and engineer, I put that loosely, engineer the parking area and then come before the town with a proposal for that. But we don't really anticipate that there's any 
retaining the wall or anything of that nature that will be needed. I think I answered it right. Okay. Uh, David Rosenberg, North Street. Uh, with with respect to the uh, issue that was raised about the uh, wording and the use of constructing as uh, contrast with the uh, phrase the right to construct, um, before hearing what Cindy said, I sort of sketched out exactly the same wording, and I'd like to um, uh, move to amend the motion to uh, replace the word constructing with the phrase the right to construct. It would require a second. Second. All right, for the viewers following along at home, what this now means is that we have tabled the original motion that we were talking about relative to Article 8, and we are now going to discuss the motion to amend. The motion to amend is simply whether or not the language should remain, as Cindy indicated, incorrectly. Not Cindy indicated incorrectly, but the, right, the incorrect language should remain. Or should we correct the language? That's the only thing. Should the language be changed? That's the only thing that's before you right now. Whether or not to have the amended motion argued or the main motion argued. Are there any questions or comments relative to the motion to amend such that the um, language would be changed from constructing to the right to construct? Seeing none, all those in favor of amending the motion uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. So now, this gets even more exciting, now we are arguing the pros and cons of Article 8 as amended. And as amended, it is the right to construct a parking area thereon. That's the only amendment. So if there's any more questions or comments relative to Article Number 8, don't hesitate to come to a microphone. But I see, I see a couple people slowly, not, not racing to the microphone like I've been begging you for three and a half years, but slowly coming to the microphone. Yes, please. Andrea Langhauser, Main Hill Ave. Did anybody tell Cece what a great job she has here? <laughs> really nice. Really nice. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I just wanted to thank John for coming up because he gave um, Mass Audubon an opportunity to explain what I think is one of the best reasons why we want to partner with a land trust. They were able to get a, a bargain sale. Um, they have shown that they can manage property very well. Um, and they're putting money aside for management of it right now. So um, thank you, John. Great points to make for, uh, for supporting this article. And I'm happy to say thank you so much, Mrs. Moderator. And I can say Mrs. Moderator. My name is Jessica Watson. And I'm on Castle Road. Um, I would also like to say that um, I think it's a wonderful plus plus for both Stony Brook, Mass Audubon, as well as our town um, to purchase this land. I um, used to work as a preschool, um, I can't even remember now because I'm outreach coordinator, and I would go to the children and talk about nature, but it's a much different thing to be able to go out in nature and see it, and I know that Doug Williams and Mass Audubon has done a wonderful job of educating our children, and we are so fortunate to have a sanctuary here in our town, and um, I think that this land would be a wonderful extension of a program they already do very well, not only maintaining the land, but also educating our future, the reason why we are so fortunate to have this land and what we can do to preserve, educate in the future. So thank you. Seeing no one else at a microphone, all of those in favor of approval of Article 8 as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, majority carried, while well, it was not unanimous, the ayes carried. Article 9. Madam Moderator, I move to approve Article 9 as written in the warrant. Okay. 
Article 9 is looking to appropriate and transfer from the Community Preservation Fund Historic Reserve a sum of 12000 to establish a formal entrance to the historical Highland Lake and Vales Memorial Park. This would include surveying, wetlands, delineation, trail mapping, parking, and to create informative sign panels at the Highland Lake, City Mills, and Pondville. I understand that actually I have uh, CPC having three minutes to discuss this article. No? Is it going to be you who's going to discuss this article? Well then, all right. Take however much time you want. Brought, You've always got some interesting stuff. I brought her about all of you in King Street under the Historical Commission. Uh, I would remind those of you who were here that four years ago we, we passed a town meeting an approval to establish a bill for Memorial Park. Uh, we're still waiting to dedicate both of that park. The original entry at 24 Campbell, which is the pink area on the upper right part of the map, is, has been at a standstill embroiled in a legal in a tangle of legal, legal ownership of the property. State cutbacks in the have a forced the North Norfolk County engineers who we had engaged to, to map the, the park and the and the trails uh, forced them to abandon the project. But they were very gracious in that they turned over to the historic commission all of their product of their work. So they gave us all of the deeds and all of the maps and all of the plans that they had accumulated in their study in order to survey it. And among those, it was there that I came upon an 18, 1988 map that showed this access road, which I would like to propose to be utilized to as an entry, a second entry to the Bills Memorial Park. All right. We've already talked about the, the Grove, and this, of course, this area on the right-hand side was part of the Highland Grove Park. The, when they, as, the, as we approach the 20th century, the New York and New Haven and Hartford Railroad took over the line, and they were not interested in the park, they were not interested in passenger service, they were interested in freight. So the park began to fall into decline, and by 1910 it was abandoned. The, a few more years passed, and at the, about the time of World War I, the railroad wanted to shed itself of this property, and so they found a buyer in the Quincy Ice Company, and Quincy Ice purchased all the land around the park, which had been all that we saw on the previous map. And they set up an ice harvesting uh, operation on the west side of the lake, including an ice house, and they included a railroad spur so they could bring the freight cars down and load them with ice, and in the winter, it was a very active operation. And tons and tons of ice from Highland Lake were shipped down to Quincy to supply the Boston market. This operation continued until the 1930s. And when the Depression occurred, the, the ice company, uh, of course, their sales began to decline. They looked for added revenue. And it was at this point in time they came up with a bright idea that they would develop some resort property on the lake. So they carved out on the right side of the lake an orange area, and they set up four house lots to sell for cottages on the lake. They sold three of them, and that is the private property that remains there to the present day. They also, at that time, created an access road to get in there, and they came off of Main Street, just after you cross the Fisher Bridge, and it goes between, uh, was it, Tenant? We said it before, 10 and 20, is it? A 10, yeah, 10 and 20 Main Street. It's a 50 mile, 50 foot right away between those two house lots at the bottom. And then it goes up to the properties on the lake. And then you'll notice at the top it has a loop. And the loop was because that large piece that butts into the lake was actually two pieces. And that was to get into the lake side of the, of the lot. So one could be approached from the from the east and the other you had to go up and around and in to get get to the to the property that was right on the lake. The what we're proposing is to use utilize the lower part of this access road to come in off of Main Street and then about halfway between the house lots that occupy the space along Main Street, those being the orange area on the map, and the Property, private property on the lake. 
to create a pull-off area. Because the top road that goes up there, the dirt road that goes up, is 20 feet wide, two cars. And in order to turn a car around, you need to get a place where you can head in. So we'd like to create about a two-car space so that people who want to visit the park can go that far, pull in, and then follow the trails up to the, to the uh, park area. Uh, <clears throat> with a minimal amount of disruption and disturb, we're not talking about a tar parking lot. We're talking just an area that will be covered over with wood chips that the cars can pull into and not be in the way to block the traffic. We would also add signage so as to dissuade people from following the road further up and disturbing people who are up on the lake, which is their constant complaint that people are coming up there and trespassing on their property. The distance between the house lot on Main Street and the, the private property on the lake is a prime measure of up to approximately 400 feet. So roughly, depending on the location, what we find in a wetland survey, <coughs> we would like to put it about halfway, which would put it about 200 and some feet behind the backyards of those who live on Main Street and 200 and uh, some feet uh, this side of people who live out on the lake which I think is a, a sufficient buffer to preserve their privacy. And it would also funnel them into the trails that would go up into the park. So that, uh, <coughs> that's part one of this, this proposal. The second part is simply lumped in there, and that is the creation of more of these historic impulse paths. One would be the Highland Grove panel that I spoke of earlier, which would go to the left of the access road, where the park would be, and the other two are intended, one to go out in Pondville, and the other to go up in City Mills. And these, I think, are a very, very effective way of telling and preserving the history of North Park, and as we tell, talk about the various areas of town. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody with any questions or comments for letter article number nine? Um. I just want to be sure that I'm understanding the math correctly. Uh, am I correct that the uh, sort of orangish, brownish area is now private property and the white area inside that is town owned property? And if that's, that is correct. Okay. You're, getting some, you're getting some nods. So, thank you. Any other questions or comments relative to Article 9? Seeing no one approaching the microphone, all of those in favor of approval of Article 9 as written in the warrant, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It is unanimous. The majority was required. <laughs> Article 10. Madam Moderator, I move to approve Article 10 as printed in the warrant. Second. This article basically wipes out the affordable uh, housing component of the uh, Community Preservation Fund. Um, it is the reason for asking for this transfer is that um, although there's no specific use in my for at this moment, uh, moving it out of this uh, Community Preservation Fund into the Affordable Housing Trust would uh, make the funds available for action should an opportunity to purchase uh, a piece of affordable housing occur. Um, the uh, real estate market is, uh, as I think most of you know, Norfolk especially heating up. And uh, if an opportunity were to arise in the next two or three months, uh, we would be unable to act because moving money out of the Community Preservation Fund requires a vote of town meeting, and that will happen again until the spring. So the idea is to get this money into the hands of the uh, Municipal Housing Trust at this point, and uh, if there's an opportunity to arise, to say the first Um, could you clarify what other use could have been made of the money if it were not transferred into the Affordable Housing Trust? Uh, well, since I'm standing, uh, uh, the, uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but this money is uh, specifically designated for uh, affordable housing, no matter uh, what the process is. So it could not be used for anything except affordable housing. This simply makes it uh, makes the transfer that otherwise we would have to wait until a specific opportunity arose. Mr. Lincoln? 
Just to add to uh, Mr. Steve's comments, it, it's the same funds for affordable housing that can be spent one of two ways. Either the CPC can spend the funds or the municipal housing trust can spend the funds. The difference is that CPC has to come before this body for you to appropriate the money for them to spend it. Simply means that twice a year you can authorize them to buy something. When you transfer it to the municipal housing trust, they can act immediately and take advantage of the market without having to come to this body to already appropriate the funds. Any other questions? Paul Terrio, 57 Rock Road, member of the uh, CPC. Um, the CPC is comprised of uh, four sections, historic, recreation, open space, and affordable housing. The funds that are in the affordable housing part have to be utilized for affordable housing. We're conveying current funds that are in that pot now into the hands of the Affordable Housing Committee. Going forward, that pot gets recharged as we receive funds in from our own self-tax and from the matching tax from the state. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments relative to Article Number 10? Seeing none, all of those in favor of approval of Article Number 10 as written in the warrant, please say aye.
The answer, to, the direct answer to your question would be no. What town count, previous town council determined was because it did not go through town meeting, the correction of the staggered terms, that it was just the a, it was the remainder of an unexpired term, even though it was listed as a three-year term. Since it hadn't been approved by town meeting as changing it, it had to be viewed as the remainder of an unexpired term. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Carry on. Thank you so much. I believe that this article actually will create more chaos than it deserves. And I believe it creates a convoluted scenario for our future election in May. So with your permission, I would like to move to indefinitely postpone this article. Second. So, Anne. Yeah. There is, there has been a motion and it's been seconded. So the current motion on the floor is whether or not to indefinitely postpone article number 11. And so residents of the town feel free to come up to the microphone and speak for or against simply whether or not to indefinitely postpone article number 11. My name is Tian Fallon. I read on that election. I, I'm not interested in, in, in what you did. I'm interested in where you are from. Uh, 27 Hill Crest Village, Nova. Thank you. In the opinion that was written by Council, said very clearly that it, uh, that it was a one-year term. It wasn't a three-year term. It shouldn't be changed for this now to come up before the people to change this. It's wrong. It is a three-year term. When it comes up in May, it should be another three-year term. So I'm asking the, the people to vote. To indefinitely postpone? Postpone. Okay. David Street address. Paul Terry, 57 Rocket Road. Just for the record, uh, I am one of the town constables. Uh, my term is up this year. Uh, the solution that's been put forward by town council and our uh, town clerk, it is somewhat convoluted, and it's not quite clear. Uh, by if we pass this motion, there'll be two ballot questions on the ballot: one for a three-year term, and one for a two-year term. Am I correct? Okay. Am I also correct in asking? that if there's two ballot questions, in order to ensure as much success of being elected, is it possible for one candidate to pull papers for both positions because it's a two ballot issue? Is this relative to the no. motion?
Marjorie Cooper, Ian Berkner, Walk and I me. At first, when I first read this article, I wasn't quite sure exactly why it was on. Um, I understood in terms of trying to manage so there wasn't one constable uh, or two constables leaving at the same time. However, I really think the verbiage is wrong in this article. And I think based on what I've seen at the polls, having worked the polls several times, um, if we put, I think one of the gentlemen already said this, if we put two distinct areas of people voting, many people will say, all right, you voted for that, I don't need to vote for the next one. So that means that negates that, and we have the potential of having only one possible. Um, I think that um, very often people come in thinking that it's going to be very simplistic when, um, again, those who have worked it and are aware of voting in, in government times. Um, it's not as simple as it seems. So I just think that the verbiage here is um, just not clear enough for the general person, and that general person is not in this audience. Um, and so subsequently, I would vote this down. Anyone else would like to make a comment? Madam Moderator, Sean Julie Kempler, 76 Cleveland Street. Uh, just to clarify a few different things um, from the standpoint of, first of all, uh, to address Paul's question that he started to ask um, in, the, in the previous IP issue, two people, uh, one person is not allowed to run for both positions because no one person could uh, win both positions. If there's two positions in the school committee, you know, uh, you cannot win both positions. So you cannot serve, uh, so that would not be allowed. Um, that's, that's by the state statute. Uh, second of all, we'll be very, very clear on the ballot, and it actually happens all the time. If uh, Mr. Gary is up this year. If Mr. Mr. Gary is up this year, if Mr. Lehan at the same time resigns, then we would have two positions available on the on the ballot for selectmen. The first selectman's position would be Mr. Gary's position, it would be a three-year term. The second position would be Mr. Lehan's position, which is the remainder of his term, which would be an additional two years. So what this ballot uh, what this does is it allows us to have the town constable staggered. And so there would be basically a three-year term, Mr. Terrio's term, which would be a new three-year term. The other one would be a two-year term, which would act as if it was the remainder of a, a, a previous three-year term, as if someone was elected last year. The reason we have asked to put this on is this is how it was done in the past. It's been back and forth. It's been changed numerous times throughout our town history. Um, Never, never appropriately, but it's just been done you know, either accidentally or, or on purpose, we don't know. Um, but what having count, counts, uh, constables staggered, in addition to um, what Pat said of having, not having two brand new constables at the same time, it also prevents any overlap. So currently, you know, we, a, a lot of town constables in a lot of towns, but we, use, we happen to use the police force to uh, guard the ballot boxes here in Norfolk. But in a lot of towns, the constable guards the ballot box. If, in a, in a case in a year, when both constables were up for re-election, we would not be able to have a constable guard the uh, ballot boxes. Um, we would have to bring in a police officer or someone from another town to guard the ballot boxes. The Secretary of State's office prefers it to be uh, done, done both ways. Um, you know, I, I personally think it's cleaner to have it staggered. So what will happen is in the future, three years, two years from now, the person will be run for a new three-year term, and the following year after that, that house will be run as a three-year term. So it would be a staggered three-year term, just like every other committee and board in, in the town. Thank you.
It takes the chaos off the ballot because right now, under this motion, you could have three candidates running for one position and not for the second position. You could have two candidates running for the second position and not the first position. You can have any one of a number of solutions on the ballot. And if you talk about chaos, that's chaos when you're in a ballot situation. And it's not clear that where the candidate has to declare which position they would run for. Thank you. Mr. Gary? I'll give you a profoundly disinterested opinion on this, um, as I don't, frankly, I, I don't know what to do is the right position. Mr. Terry, I respect you, but you're wrong. This, the position that Mr. Flaherty was elected to was retroactively, perhaps, but deemed to be a one-year position. So if you vote this down, what you'll see in the ballot box when you walk in there next May will be two positions up, both for three years. If you pass this, you'll walk into the ballot. If you do pass this, you'll walk into the ballot box next year and see two positions up, one for three, one for two. Under both scenarios, you could have six people running for one and no people for the other one. All right, that, that can happen either way. So choose what you want. If you want a standard uh, constable position, so only one is up at any one time, vote yes on this. If you want it like it's been in the past, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe it got switched around, maybe some of the town clerks screwed up uh, in 1994 and we did it wrong. If you want two at the same time, vote no. But that's, that's it. There's no big conspiracy here. There's nothing about a, a havoc at the ballot box. It's pretty much the same way it's always been. But that's your, that's your choice. Anybody else? Well, I, I'm sorry, I knew you were there. We were so quiet. David Rosenberg, North Street. Is the microphone on? Okay, sir. Um, David Rosenberg, North Street. Um, um, so I don't want to talk, I want to talk to the issue of what this affects, not, not its substance. This says to see if the town will vote to clarify the terms of the election of constables, and I'm not sure how a clarification is accomplished. I mean, is that, um, you know, saying we think this and it gets recorded in the minutes, but then it is lost and lets somebody goes back to the minutes of this town meeting. Um, I don't see any attempt to amend the bylaws. I, my, my, the substance, the point of my question is, is how does this get memorialized so that whichever decision is reached will be part of the town procedure going forward? This is, sin, this is, you know, back, in, this goes back to the prior town council as well. Uh, we're just trying to clarify the terms. So obviously, you know, obviously, as we've said several times, there's been some changes over the years. So this is simply to say, and town meeting has the authority to set the terms, that we're going to have now a two-year term and a three-year term. And as we said, going forward, those will then be three-year terms, uh, all staggered by one year. Um, so we've heard that in the past there have been different practices, perhaps in error, or perhaps by intention, but different, you know, different things have happened that got us into the situation. And the concern that I have is that unless we do something to prevent that, this will be forgotten at some point, and will, you know, perhaps in 10 or 15 or 30 years run into a similar problem again. Um, I don't want to um, try drafting any other motion right now, but um, I would like to suggest that if this passes, that if it's the sense of the town that we do want the stagger terms, that that be incorporated in some more permanent uh, way than merely um, uh, in effect a resolution passed by this body that That could easily get lost. That, that was some more comment than a question. Okay. Does anybody else have a question or comment relative to Article Number Eleven? Seeing no one at a microphone. All of those in favor of Article Eleven, which would result in both positions being voted on this spring and a resultant staggered voting in the future, please say aye. 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 Which would result in both positions.
together for every year in the future, please say nay. Nay. The majority was required the eyes carry. Article 12. Most work. 
one of the issues, we, and we went out about uh, 9 o'clock and found uh, seven or eight contractors working, and we had to shut them down because it violated the bylaw to the veterans today. And that was my opinion. It should have been working. Uh, we have a town bylaw that says so. It's, it's false on the police department to say that, uh, that, that we enforce it. We did. We told them all to shut down and go home. And my, my opinion and feeling is that there's seven, six days a week, Monday through Saturday, 7 to 7, that you can get work done. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There are these four holidays that seem to be the ones that they like to try to work on. Uh, I don't want to call them lesser holidays, but they, 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 they keep us, uh, tend to like to do that. But my opinion is for the residents, it's nice to be able to sit in your yard and not listen to bang, 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 and uh, machinery's running, dump trucks with the tailgate uh, make a lot of noise, excavators make a noise, and then there's other things. There could be a simple nail gun, generator, uh, all, all those things that make noise at a construction site. So Jack and I have talked about this uh, time and time again, and I just, I just said, you know, we won't leave those four on there. I think it's fair. Uh, and we just will, I, I probably will not issue a permit unless they can make a really stated case to either Jack or I uh, for, for the other seven that are there. Thank you. Anybody else have a question or comment related to Article 12? Seeing none, Mr. Chair, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Madam moderator, I move to approve Article 13 as printed in the law. Second. The town recently discovered that a bolted easement that affects part of the part of the house near the transfer station. Uh, this easement serves no purpose for the town and is a potential problem for the home for the home owner. Any questions or comments on Article 13? David Rosenberg, you have to um, Do you happen to know how the town acquired that easement? Anything about the history of, of how we got it? Mr. Hathaway. Very, very old easement. No. The easement is literally right near somebody's house. It's, I, the, we don't, you know, the, the house the transactions, there's several transactions that should not occur. Um, it's really a, a meaningless easement to us, so we don't want it. my question, uh, which is, uh, this says there are two easements. Could you describe the second easement, or is it all part of the same thing, or why is it written for two, Jack? Thank you. 